We have one more panel before our closing conversation. And this will be our panel on AML and financial inclusion. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator, Joanne Barefoot. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Barefoot. I know it's getting to be late in the day, but we are going to give you a lively panel. And I'm excited about the fact that I think our topic is going to weave together many of the things that we've been talking about over the last day and a half. Um, so maybe we'll be able to bring some general perspective to it. I am CEO of AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, and a co-founder of Hummingbird RegTech. Yep. And I am thrilled to introduce my panel and first to thank the University of Michigan again, uh, Michael and Adrian and their amazing team. I myself am an undergraduate alum of the University of Michigan. It's just been a joy to be back on campus. And I also want to thank the Gates Foundation for the incredible visionary work that you do in this area <clears throat> and everything else. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing uh, our panelists. We are each going to make some opening comments and then we're going to have a conversation. And my first guest far to the right is Jennifer Calvary. Uh, my guests have long titles, so I'm going to read them. Uh, she is the Global Head of Financial Crime Threat Mitigation at HSBC and also Group General Manager based in London. She runs a unified global capability that leverages analytics and technology to identify, analyze, and investigate financial crime risk to their HSBC group in 60 countries. She and Aaron both have an amazing background in both the public and private sectors, and Jennifer was previously the director of FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So she was the senior person in the United States running the anti-money laundering um, uh, organization in the Treasury Department. Prior to that, she spent 15 years as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice um, dealing with money laundering, corruption, fraud, and organized crime. My other guest uh, is Aaron Klein. Aaron is the uh, Economic Studies Fellow and Policy Director of the Center on Regulations and Markets at the Brookings Institution. Prior to that, he ran the Bipartisan Policy Center's work in this field. And uh, before that, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy in addition to having served on the Senate Banking Committee staff, as did I, but much earlier than you did. So I'm going to ask them in a few moments to, as I said, give some opening comments. But first, I'm going to set the stage a little bit and talk with a wide lens about anti-money laundering uh, in, as an issue in general and specifically for financial inclusion. Uh, Bill Gates famously said, we tend to overestimate the change that will happen in a year or two and underestimate the change that will happen in 10. And here we are looking at this 50 year time frame. And I think it's important to, as we ponder this, to think about the fact that as change occurs over that long trajectory, it's not going to be a gradual linear slope. It's much more likely that we're going to go through a series of sort of hockey stick changes that are going to catch us by surprise. There's a character in the novel by Ernest Hemingway who is asked how he went bankrupt. And he says, at first gradually, and then suddenly. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with, a big shift to a new world that we know we're all working in because finance is digitizing and financial regulation is going to do the same. The AML system that we have today, I'll be interested to see if my panelists agree, uh, is broken. And it's important that we fix it, and we can fix it. it. There's a tendency sometimes, especially in the financial world, to think about financial crime and money laundering as white collar crime or victimless crime. And it's really among the most terrible types of crime on Earth. It funds terrorism and it funds illegal trafficking in weapons and drugs and looted antiquities and endangered wildlife. 
and in human beings. And the human trafficking issue, just to pick out one uh, facet of this to focus on, the uh, UK Financial Conduct Authority uses the numbers that there are 40 million people today enslaved as human captives, uh, more than all of the older history of the world combined. 10 million are children, and a million children are enslaved for sexual exploitation. This is crime that's been growing and that we need to figure out how to stop. And uh, we work very hard to stop it. The industry, the uh, UN estimates is that there's uh, about $1.6 trillion laundered every year and that we catch less than 1% of that with the tools that we use today. And that's despite uh, spending tens of billions of dollars a year to try to catch it and despite all the efforts of the kinds of people in this room who are working from a regulatory and enforcement standpoint um, to fix it. Uh, I've, it you, you'll get my presentation, it's got some more statistics on it, but this effort is not working. We have a, you know, you can, you can debate it at the margin, but we've got basically a 99% failure rate. And then beyond that, AML is not just failing, but it's also doing harm. It does cause financial exclusion and makes it difficult for people to come into the financial system, which is the main focus of the Gates work in this space. As has been discussed all day, many people can't qualify, they can't prove who they are easily enough or can't easily get into the financial system and have access to it. And so there's been a lot of work looking at the impact of the de-risking uh, process, particularly what we've seen um, in part from the United States in fueling, cutting off of whole sectors, whole countries, and even humanitarian crises. Again, I've got a few quotes here um, from some of the people who have looked at these problems. So we ask ourselves, why aren't we doing better if we're spending so much? And I think there's three answers to that. The first is that the forces of the financial world and, the, uh, and of law enforcement and regulation are using old technology, and the criminals are using great new technology more and more and more. Secondly, we are using old analog era identity systems that have just created a terrible, terrible challenge with the know your customer rules. It is important that people be identified to come into the system, but whether you're in a developing country or a developed country, both models are broken in terms of people being able easily to prove who they are and begin to think about moving to uh, a digital identity system that could be both effective and efficient. And the third thing that causes great difficulty in this system is that the forces for good need to protect the privacy of the individuals in the system, and the criminals don't. They share information freely, they buy and sell uh, data without any uh, restriction on it. And uh, we, on the other hand, cannot easily share data uh, with each other. And uh, the watchword that has developed to capture this point is uh, the slogan that it takes a network to defeat a network, and we are not well networked. Uh, in fighting financial crime. So the thing I'm gonna, going to focus on for a moment before I turn it over uh, to Jen, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion of this with Jen uh, when we get into the panel, is that there are a lot of people working on all three of those problems, and the, in particular, people are working on the third one, by trying to evaluate the potential of privacy-enhancing technologies to enable safe, widespread sharing of information between banks and each other, banks and governments, across country borders, and so on. And this issue was the focus of a, a hackathon this year in July run by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK to study the potential of privacy-enhancing technologies. Jen was there. She and I were both at their um, similar event a year earlier uh, to study new types of ways of uh, limiting the knowledge that's being shared. If you think about, a, um, if you think about wanting to buy uh, liquor 
uh, and having to hand your driver's license to a clerk in a store, there's no reason that that clerk needs even to know what your birthday is, not to mention all the other information on your driver's license. All he or she needs to know is uh, that you're old enough to buy it. And so there's a lot of emergence of thinking about, can we just give smaller amounts of information that solve the problem at hand and not share everything? The FCA uh, invented this technique called tech sprints. They are uh, hackathons. Uh, the FCA will tell you we are regulators, so we don't like the word hack, and so we call them tech sprints. And when they ran the one this year, they asked AIR, our new nonprofit, to run a Washington satellite site for it. And uh, we had a very productive week uh, running the first ever US tech sprint, uh, focusing on AML issues. We had a great turnout of large and small banks and fintechs, and a great turnout of government agencies. Um, we had 65 regulators participate in the US over the week, in addition to a much bigger event that happened in, um, in London. And we had it keynoted by the FDIC chairman, uh, Yelena McWilliams, who has been a real driver for regulatory modernization in the United States. And she also uh, was a judge in the, uh, the program. And we are excited to say that on Monday, we are going to FinCEN to meet with the director and his direct reports with the teams that were in the hackathon and present their solutions to FinCEN and model a new way of thinking about how to accelerate change by not just having working groups and conversations, but actually getting people together cross discipline and writing some computer code. Um, and back to the point that these issues are coming fast. This is a quote from our friends in the UK who said they realize that if they don't move forward, given the pace of change in today's uh, technology world, in effect, they'll be accelerating backwards and that they need, we need to move forward even when we're not totally sure exactly what it is that we think we should do. So many uh, regulators throughout the world, central banks and other regulators are working on these issues. So are our ones in the United States. And um, I'll just offer this as something to think about and then turn to Jen. Um, who can tell me whose picture that is? Barney Frank, Barney Frank our former congressman. Barney Frank of uh, Dodd-Frank co-sponsorship fame. Uh, brilliant man, I will say. Um, and this, of course, is a picture of Steve Jobs. And we've been trying to ask the question, what would happen if you gave the same problem, if you had been able to give the same problem to Barney Frank and to Steve Jobs? They would approach it completely differently. Can we begin to create regulatory innovation models that are getting the best of both of these kinds of thinking combined at the same table, working on the same problems at the same time? I'll just mention very quickly, I am a senior fellow at Harvard. I have a series of papers coming out on these topics. And I have a podcast show called Barefoot Innovation on these topics, which I commend to you. I had wanted to show you a video from the FCA, and we weren't able to do it technically. But this is one slide from it. I urge you to go to the FCA's website and watch the video of their seventh tech sprint, the one that they just held, to talk about what they think they can do with technology to do better uh, for anti-money laundering um, and the fairness and efficiency both of the system. So with that, I want to turn it over to Jen. Um, and she is going to talk to us for a little bit. And then, Erin, I think you have some slides as well. Jen. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Adrian and, and Michael as well and your team for the kind invitation to be here today. Um, I did not go to the University of Michigan, but I did grow up about a half hour away from here. So it's, it's nice to be home. And I'll see if I can't even get a little bit of my prior Michigan accent to come out during the course of this discussion. It's mostly lost, but we'll see. Um, so as Joanne mentioned, uh, I, I started my career, my professional life, as a prosecutor at the US Department of Justice. 
Um, and towards the end, uh, after 15 years there, um, became an executive leading prosecutors. My last job at the department was heading up um, the, the, the organization that was in charge of money laundering prosecutions, uh, recovering funds from things like uh, kleptocracy abroad, but also prosecuting financial institutions that failed to have effective anti-money laundering programs in place or engaged in sanction stripping. So from that position, I moved over to FinCEN uh, to be a regulator and to be the uh, in, uh, part of an organization that collects all the data that banks file, all those reports that banks file, those go to FinCEN, and, and they're the financial intelligence unit. So did that, and then moved over to HSBC where uh, I work on the same issues. Um, I moved to HSBC and tell people that after 20 years in the US government and someone who cared a lot about um, uh, keeping communities safe, that I thought I could make a bigger impact on the world for good at HSBC if I could help them to be effective at that, um, at that aspect of their responsibility than I could even in the US government. Uh, and I have to say that hasn't changed now after three years at HSBC. Although it does occur to me that there is now one position left in the anti-money laundering um, financial crime space that I have not done, and that would be to actually launder the money or help criminals to launder money. So I'm gonna keep that out there as a possible future job opportunity. Um, but for now, focus on, on still trying not to stay on the right side of the, of the law. So, um, you know, listening to the, the discussions throughout the last couple days, it occurs to me that as we talked about the financial crime agenda uh, in the context of uh, financial inclusion, it was, it was so much of the conversation has been about how it is a hurdle to or obstruction to uh, that end, that end game, that goal of financial inclusion. Um, and I can't help but wonder, uh, and have given quite a bit of thought to, does it need to be that way? Uh, is, the, is, that, is that a fair uh, uh, assessment, first of all? And if so, does it really need to be that way? And so I thought I'd just spend a, a few minutes talking about that, that question um, before we go into the, to over to Aaron and into the broader panel. Um, so is it an impediment? Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that it is. Um, and maybe I can spend just a, a moment explaining why, at least from the perspective of a, a large global financial institution, we're in more than 60 countries, we have more than 30 million customers, um, we are expected to and, and, and want to um, uh, make sure that we don't have uh, criminals exploiting our financial services to harm our customers and our communities, so that can be everything from fraud to money laundering to sanctions to tax evasion, corruption, uh, human rights abuse, human trafficking, all the, the kind of ills we don't want to be exploited uh, for those ends. Uh, but we need to try to do that by monitoring uh, transactions and, and uh, understanding the individuals with whom we're, uh, who we're banking and with whom they're transacting, our customers are transacting. So let me try to put a little bit of a color around that. On a monthly basis, we uh, screen 658 million transactions through 200 million accounts. Um, when we get a list of 10 names and asked, uh, you know, do you bank, these are 10 names of individuals, do you bank any of these folks? We'll tend to come back with thousands of, of hits on those 10 names, most of which, of course, are, are not the actual 10 people. Um, and that's if we get 10 names and not hundreds or thousands. And so the scale of trying to do, under the best of intentions, uh, a, a good job at this is just daunting. Um, and the way that institutions have done it today is not particularly effective. Um, and this is across the board. It's the, the system across the board. The way we try to, to perform um, these responsibilities today is we look at transactions individually and we try to understand uh, if they are suspicious of financial crime. So when you have that many transactions, to start a transaction and screen that using rules-based systems means that um, the uh, alerts to actual real suspicious activity uh, ratio is very low, so in single digits. 
um, most of what we do is clear noise out of the, those uh, high false positive rate systems. And that's just in the AML space. We have separate systems where we look at sanctions and, and clear out all the, the false positives around name screening that we're doing. We have separate systems that focus on fraud um, and try to do the real-time uh, transactions and screening of transactions to understand if there's fraud. Um, and so we go through all these different systems, generate large amounts of false positives, ultimately get to uh, reports that we do provide to government to help them keep communities safe. Uh, in Europe, I've seen some studies saying uh, that only about 10% of those are actually used by law enforcement in Europe, and we've all seen the the statistics that only about 1% of criminal assets are actually confiscated each year. Um, that's not to minimize some very good work that does come out of that, and there is some really important and great work that, that comes uh, uh, in, the, in the financial crime space, um, but it's, I don't think it's a system that any of us could look at end to end and say that we feel it's terribly effective at achieving the goals we want it to achieve. So there is a large conversation, a wide recognition, I think globally, amongst regulators, amongst industry, that we need to do something to achieve the ends that that, um, that the uh, financial crime uh, uh, mandate is, is seeking to achieve. And then when you put that next to what about the, the potential negative impacts it has on financial inclusion, how do you think about that? So the reason that we see the, the negative impacts on financial inclusion is because like, with a blunt system like the one I just uh, described, rules-based, very blunt view to try to find suspicion, we're not very good at finding it, which means that if we're operating in a high-risk jurisdiction and high-risk products, high-risk clients, we run a very high uh, potential of missing the real financial crime, and we face the very real possibility of having enforcement actions um, that uh, levy fines over a billion dollars on institutions. Um, and so trying to understand the, the risk there, you end up with uh, financial institutions all making and assessing the risk in the same way. So you see financial institutions all saying the same jurisdictions, the same products, the same uh, uh, classes of customers are risk and we're not sure how to manage it. And so when everyone leaves that jurisdiction at the same time, um, we end up with the de-risking debates with the financial inclusion issues. Um, and so, uh, that's that's where we see uh, the impacts. So then we turn to the question, but does it have to be that way? <laughs> um, is And I don't think it does. So for many of the reasons and the things we've been talking about today, the opportunities that technology provide for us, I think we can go a long way in being more effective at identifying financial crime and thus being far more um, uh, uh, targeted in our actions, um, which number one means we don't have to de-risk entire categories of, of clients, um, and secondly can give us the confidence to go into jurisdictions or take on clients that we haven't had the confidence in the past because we weren't sure we could actually identify risk when it occurred there. Um, we're doing a lot of thinking, certainly at my institution, but others as well, is how exactly do we get from here to there? Um, and we're focused on looking, um, taking all the data essentially at our disposal that we already have, uh, looking at uh, financial crime holistically. So instead of doing it in silos, fraud versus sanctions versus money laundering, look at a customer or their counterparty and try to understand the probability that this customer poses a significant financial crime risk to us today. You Updating that view dynamically as we get in new data each day um, and being able to understand down to a very high definition view what is the probability that someone poses a financial crime risk. And you could imagine if we were able to do that, really zoom in, almost like a camera and a high definition camera in and understand where there is risk and pinpoint that risk and take what the appropriate actions, it means that we could also zoom out 
and understand what a risk is of a product, of a jurisdiction, of a sub-sub-sub-jurisdiction, and, and m be much more able to go into places that we haven't had the confidence to go into in the past. For a big bank like ours, um, where our, our business model is not mass retail at the, at the, um, uh, at the lowest uh, uh, social and social economic end, um, it doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden gonna, gonna move into a different business model in that sense. But what it does mean is that several of the, the uh, whether it's fintechs or traditional uh, financial um, institutions who do operate in that space and eventually need access to the international finance system or products that we're willing to go in and engage those institutions or at least have the confidence that we would be able to do that. So I do think then that there is an ability both to improve our financial crime outcomes, make our communities safer, keep them safe, uh, while at the same time making it so that financial inclusion and financial crime are mutually supportive and not at odds with one another. In fact, it's fascinating to hear some of the ideas, the policy ideas around financial inclusion are, are some of the same ones that are needed um, to implement the, the vision that I just outlined. So things like a digital identity are absolutely at the core of being able to uh, do some of the things that I'm talking about as is information sharing and the issue of data and sharing of data uh, cross-border, within an institution, between institutions, with government. Um, but the issue of information sharing and data is absolutely at the core of this. Um, the only one, we usually typically at, at HSBC, we say there's three things we need to, to really go in this direction, digital identity, uh, information sharing, and then the only one I didn't hear come up as part of a financial inclusion discussion is uh, central registries for beneficial ownership. That one is more aligned to the, the pure financial crime discussion than I think the financial inclusion. But the fact that we cross over on two out of the three major um, kind of policy solutions, I think is, is just indicative of the fact that we're, there's more in common between these two policy goals than there is intention between them. Um, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll say uh, before, before turning it over to you, Aaron, is also trying to think, I guess, as I was listening to the discussion over the last couple days, what the significance to central banks might be to the extent that the central bank of the future offers financial services, such as a stable coin, or, or in the, we're really working more on the payment rails. And I wonder um, how much of the risks that I have to manage every day all of a sudden become your reality as well. <laughs> so um, trying to deal with all of the cyber-enabled uh, uh, fraud, looking at things like the, the swift attacks on the Bank of Bangladesh, does that become your daily reality if you're now running the payment systems? What about you keeping the, the financial cri criminals from exploiting the products and services that, that you're offering? Um, so I, I think I would leave you with be careful what you wish for on that front. Um, um, and maybe it's a new career opportunity. As I won't have to become a criminal. I can come help central banks and, and protect on that, that end. Uh, but I'll leave it there and, and turn it over to you, Aaron. Thank you. We Sorry. need to get the slides turned over. So um, let, let me just start by thanking Adrian and, and Michael uh, for having me and for putting this great event together and thank the Gates Foundation and echo a comment Michael made last night about the fantastic diversity of thought, background, experience, geography, and gender that's been represented at this conference. It's really something that's quite impressive. Uh, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. Um, I, I also, uh, let, me, let me start by saying one thing that I'm excited about, about a central bank of the future, is that central banks tend to be, if not dominated by economists, have a strong voice from economists. Economists hate unindexed numbers. The current $10,000 threshold level for currency transaction reports is hardwired into law and is unindexed. And I think it's very useful. Uh, I, I, I made this graphic when I was at the Bipartisan Policy Center and started delving into this to really think back about what this system was designed to do when it was enacted in the late 60s uh, and why the system is broken. Per Joanne's question, I will answer it. Yes, the system is broken. Uh, one of the reasons the system is broken 
is because a system designed to do everything kind of does nothing. When this system was designed in the 70s, it was designed to catch tax cheats and organized crime moving large sums of money through the financial services system, $10,000. I usually like to focus that you could buy a fully loaded Cadillac in cash and not trigger a CTR. Today, there's not a single car. But since we're here, you could have walked into the University of Michigan in 1972 and paid your entire annual tuition. At the average uh, uh, public university today, if you're out of state, you can't. At, a, at Harvard, you could have walked in and paid your entire annual tuition. Pri any, the average private university. Uh, in cash, no CTR. Uh, and part of this is because over time, this system has been bootstrapped to catch other types of criminals. In the 80s, it was moved to catch drugs and drug money. It was then again changed in, after 9-11 to catch and focus on terrorists who use the financial system for radically different purposes at radically different dollar amounts. Uh, and so you know, uh, part of this question then becomes who commits, I think Jen put it right, the real financial crime. So let's look at financial criminals who went to jail. So. Uh, the first one is Denny Haster, who's in jail for anti-money laundering, particularly for structuring. The actual crime I think he's meant to go to jail for was molestation of a child while he was a wrestling coach, but the statute of limitations for that was a long time ago. And the crime that he was easily proven of was AML and structuring. Uh, since I'm in a college audience, I'm trying to, to, to relate to the current generation a little bit more. And for those of you that knew the, the Jersey Shore, Mike, the situation, was the smartest member of the Jersey Shore, so he knew that there was a $10,000 reporting limit. He was also part of the Jersey Shore, so he thought if he continually put $9,999 into his account from DJ gigs, that he wouldn't have to report taxes on that. <laughs> now, they are financial criminals. Al Capone was a huge criminal. The gravity of what Al Capone did is stunning. He came along before AML, but obviously was brought in for tax evasion, which kind of AML was essentially a tool to catch. Uh, uh, and so, but are these the people, are these the high priority? Out of the hundreds of millions of transactions that Jen's organization is looking and the scarce amount of resources we can dedicate, are these the people that we want to use the AML regime and task the central bank to commit to, to prioritize, because they're, they're criminals. So here's somebody else who's been snared in AML. Um, one I thought in the afternoon we wouldn't mind looking at, at Leo. <laughs> but beyond that, he'd gotten some money from a Malaysian film financier whose assets were eventually seized. And you can kind of go through the story and realize he had nothing to do with this. But ironically enough, the Wolf of Wall Street may have been financed. Uh, by criminally laundered funds, uh, which then when you go into asset. And, and part of the, the reason I, I pull this up here is because I think there's a thesis that often goes unstated in AML reform that conflicts with the modern reality of what it of how it actually works on the ground. And I give some deference to, to Jen on this to, to agree or disagree with me, and, and you have more experience in it. But the thesis kind of goes as follows. Criminals are operating in the bottom of the ocean, which is super dark and hard to find. Criminals generate financial profits, particularly a lot of the heinous crimes that Joanne was talking about, human trafficking, et cetera. That profit, like money, kind of bubbles up to the surface. And when, if you could find the bubbles, because it has to go through the financial system to be transmitted, particularly for international crime, which began with the, the mafia returning money or drug cartels expropriating money out of the United States, but either way, money needs to move around borders, that then you could find the crime bubbles, the money would be easy to find, and then you could trace it down the water and catch the bad guys. What I think instead we've actually ended up with is more of a system where law enforcement kind of finds bad guys on their own, and then often kind of queries the SAR database to look at the bubbles up, because at the end of the day, that's an easier case to prove. Joanne, in one of her papers, had a nice quote from a former law enforcement official that said, you know, one of the things is you tend to prosecute the easier cases. Yeah, we, uh, we catch the stupid criminals. 
And it helps kind of pause this other question, why are we only catching 1% of the money, right? The money isn't, isn't necessarily where we're looking, but I mean, these are quote unquote real financial criminals. Here is a graphical uh, thing of just the amount of suspicious activity reports filed by depository institutions after Sarbanes, uh, after the Patriot Act of 9-11, we expanded the categories of filers, but so this tries to hold for that constant. But you can see this radical increase particularly recently from 2015 to 2018, even if you say that's a one year transitory, it's gone up about 30, 40%. There are a couple theses. One, there's that much more crime going on. Two, there's a ton of overreporting. Three, there's a lot, uh, um, we were never reporting the right amount to begin with. And there's some tension between these theses, but let me offer an alternative, and this gets back to my first point. If you do everything, you do nothing well. If you're looking for a needle in a haystack, we've really succeeded in throwing a lot of hay on the stack. And the question again becomes this prioritization of quote unquote, the real financial crime. I like the way that, that you said it. And ask yourselves, what is the central bank or somebody else who's in charge of monitoring AML? What crime should they prioritize using their limited resources in terms of going after folks and I want to go in and, and zoom in on one type of financial crime that's exploded since 2015 that is so prevalent, I think there are four operations uh, uh, within a walking distance of this building. The state of Michigan, like uh, uh, many other states to the point where one out of five Americans live in a state that have created state licensed cannabis. Notice I choose my words carefully here. It is not legal cannabis. The sale of cannabis is illegal under federal law, and uh, distinguished law professors far beyond me have pointed out that the theory of state nullification is not as true in cannabis today as it was when James C. Calhoun put forward in the United States. It is a federal crime, and the financial institutions are processing the sale of cannabis that is federally illegal. It is a crime. Are these the real financial criminals? Are SARS the most effective way to catch them? I knew the number of stores around here because there's a really easy way to find them. It's called Google Maps. <laughs> you, if you really want to go to the state capitol, you can go and get a registry of all of the ownership. You mentioned beneficial ownership, which is a critical issue. Uh, we had an event on that in Brookings. Um, uh, Carolyn Maloney has a bill that just uh, uh, has a lot of bipartisan support, um, and I think it's important. But this is actually an industry where the beneficial owners have licensed themselves at the state level, and you can walk into any state capital and get the beneficial ownership registry for these activities easier than for anybody else. Are filing SARS really the most effective and efficient way? And by the way, here's an interesting fact. The state of Michigan is deriving significant revenue from this which they're depositing, often in cash, is the state of Michigan committing a financial crime? Colorado's deposited a billion dollars in revenue since 2012 from their taxation and licensing fees, et cetera, from cannabis. Ironically, state and local governments are exempt from currency transaction reports, or you would find a lot of these. But on a broader level, if you replace the state of Michigan with a large private person deriving revenue from uh, contributions of the sale of cannabis, wouldn't they be a financial crime? What does it mean for a state government to get a SAR file by their bank? Because they are banked by someone. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of flag this because it, it also, to me, illustrates this question of we're using our AML to go after the wrong folk. And when you preclude cannabis from banking, which happens a lot, what do you end up with? You end up with cash-run businesses, which attract large amounts of crime. By excluding them from the financial system, you have created the, a lot of crime that the voters are attempting to mitigate through decriminalization. This is just as true for cannabis as it is for other people who seek to access the financial system. And it gets to the final tension in my, in my talk, which it revolves between this goal of Using the financial system to catch bad guys, which is an inclusive concept in which you actually want the criminals in the financial system so that the financial system can report, 
right? That is a more effective way than having the cash carried physically on airplanes and having TSA try to find the physical money. Versus the idea of excluding the criminal systems because you don't want the criminals to ride the rails of our financial system and be able to benefit and conduct crime more easily because of banking. And there's an inclusion-exclusion tension. In a paper I wrote with, with Michael Barr and Karen Gifford, we kind of take the, I think, belief that there's a win-win outcome for enhancing financial inclusion through AML reform that has two kind of core elements behind it. One is more fully leaning into the idea of an inclusive financial services sector, which then provides information to allow more efficient and effective law enforcement to catch the real financial criminals. At the same time, by enhancing financial inclusion, reduces the real crime that occurs due to financial exclusion, right? Because what, in a Maslow's hierarchy of crime, it's not clear to me that financial crime is better or worse than robbery, assault, other types of, of theft. In this situation, uh, uh, you can have tremendous savings of the amount of money spent tracking other types of financial crime or trying to exclude people from the system and plow some of that cost savings into more effectively and efficiently serving lower cost consumers. One of the earlier panelists talked about the radical decrease of cost of onboarding customers due to technology from AML. And the final point, and I'll close my presentation with this, which is that multinational financial uh, regulate, well, not regulate, but organizations, FATF, uh, BIS, uh, global coordinations have a huge role to play in this because they can set standards that allow individual countries to harmonize and prioritize crimes and criminal activity to, to, to move central banks. So as I think of what the central banks of the future will be plural, I hope they will be working together with a common set of objective standards and goals in both financial inclusion and AML and have those divisions and, and core objectives more intertwined because a financial system that includes more people is a more effective way to reduce total sum crime, which is, I think, the policy purpose of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm going to put you both on the spot. I'm going to throw the script that we had out the window. Um, and let's just talk, because we already answered the first couple of questions we had, had thought about outlining. So the bad news is the system we have now is not scalable. There's no possibility that you could spend enough money to scale it up and make a dent in the problem. Uh, the good news, though, as and Jen, you said it so well, is that more data can be a solution to this if we can figure out how to manage it safely and, and accurately. So what I want to ask you both is, for starters, if you uh, could do one thing on the policy side, thinking of yourself as a central bank of the future that had the ability to reform this system, and that would impact financial inclusion as well as the crime, what would be the most high impact thing we could do? Jim, yeah. Well, I think I, I mentioned two already, um, but if I had to, to pick one of them, um, it's information sharing uh, and, and having, uh, enabling uh, those in the system who need it regulated institutions, government, uh, to have the data at their disposal to understand the risk. Um, ensuring that information is shared cross-border. Uh, as we look at the world um, becoming more and more fractious, uh, more disputes uh, between uh, on trade and other issues, uh, we see it playing out in the data realm as well, and we see a rise in data nationalism. Uh, I think that undercuts uh, both the financial inclusion and the, the uh, financial crime agendas. So to do that, 
what is, how would we go about that? How can we share data more widely and safely? So Aaron referenced uh, the FATF already and as the international standard setting body. As the Financial Action uh, Task Force. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Financial Action Task I'm Force. I'm declaring an acronym free zone. <laughs> Try to translate all, right, all acronyms. I, I will define all acronyms <laughs> from now on. Uh, so it's the, the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. Um, and uh, pr pretty much every nation uh, in, enacts into law the standards that they set. Um, they have put some things out in guidance around information sharing, um, but probably need to strengthen that. And I think central banks play a role in enacting the laws that are encoded in that guidance and, and hopefully uh, recommendations to enable uh, information sharing. Yeah, Aaron. So the, I mean, the, this is tricky because it, there's some kind of low-hanging fruit solutions like beneficial ownership in the U.S., which is a uh, uh, Jen mentioned. But I, I'm going to try and think think big. Uh, I was motivated by the morning keynote to think think big. I would try to solve uh, the identity issue. I would try to have a globally accepted, easily accessible form of identification for this, which I think would simultaneously do wonders for financial inclusion in terms of lowering costs to operate and reducing that long list of barriers, uh, and simultaneously reduce the cost of AML compliance uh, systems as well. Uh, and I think that's a really devilly dish difficult problem. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded, in, you know, uh, uh, taking a, a a provincial view of the United States. The United States has no federal identification system beyond a social security number, which I think is somewhat easily accessible for all of us in terms of hacked and leaked information. And for the 38% of Americans who've chosen to get a passport, your passport ID. For the other 62% of Americans who don't have a passport, that's it. We have an identification system at the state level which is just a world of problems. If you talk to the, um, the sophisticated fintechs, they, and, and to the, and the sophisticated banks too, they will tell you that the, the rules that we have for identifying people, so name, address, social security or other government issued numbered and so on, that doesn't tell you anything. You, you, you have to comply with that, but then you have to go and actually gather the data to figure out who, whether people really are who they say they are and where they, I mean, it's just, it's a relic. Yeah, it's, it's um, putting together someone's identity. So again, for a bank in more than 60 countries, and we often will bank someone in more than one country, we often don't realize that we're banking the same person in more than one country. Once you put together the difficulties of identification and, and the elements that, that we piece together to, to understand identification and data privacy laws, we can't even understand our, our own customers in more than, than one jurisdiction. You can imagine the frustration when you bank with us in the US and then you come to London and want to talk to us and we don't know who you are because we don't even understand that you, you bank with us. It's getting better. I think it's, you know, uh, uh, we're, we and other institutions are doing more and more to piece that together, but it's it's nowhere near where it needs to be. And then when you try to put on uh, the ability to detect financial crime in that kind of context, or or the ability um, to have uh, enable inclusion and bring costs down, uh, it's 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 not what you would invent. I think FATF has a digital ID on their agenda this year. Uh, and China is chairing it this year, so I know there's a lot of focus on whether there can be some progress on that front. Um, so where does uh, use of machine learning and artificial intelligence come into solving this problem? We have all this data, we can't, we don't know what it's telling us, there's too much of it, it's inaccurate, and on and on. How do you, how are we gonna use machine learning? So we are thinking about it, and we do use different elements of machine learning now. Um, uh, amongst the different branches of artificial intelligence, machine, I'll focus on machine learning, um, although natural language processing is, is probably pretty important as well. 
But in that space, when we're trying to understand if a customer poses a financial crime risk, we essentially want to know, do you have any indicators, red flag indicators, that we know and the governments have told us are indicators of you being a criminal? So we want to look at that. We want to know, um, how is your activity uh, uh, changed over time, and are there any anomalies that would suggest you're, you're engaged in financial crime? We want to know how you compare to your peers and if you're an outlier. If you're a flower shop, do you have a lot more money moving through your flower shop than any other flower shop, that kind of question. And then we want to understand everyone you transact with um, and whether that tells us anything about your risk. To put all of that information together and under, uh, with an overlay of what's the probability that you pose financial crime risk to us today, we start needing to bring in machine learning to be able to do that at scale, to do it dynamically, to update. Number one, to, to process the, the pure um, volumes, but you don't have to have machine learning uh, to solve the volume problem. Um, but you do uh, to start doing those volumes around unsupervised techniques where you're looking for anomalies and outliers. And so um, we use and are increasingly looking to use machine learning in those contexts, uh, which means that a big issue for us these days is data ethics. Um, and watching what regulators and central banks and other governments are putting out there on the topic of data ethics. I think Singapore has put out some interesting uh, guidance in that respect, um, and developing our own internal principles and practices to make sure that we're comfortable doing the things we do and are, want to do with data. So uh, I'll have a little fun and, and kind of raise my concerns and flags on false pause on, on AI and ML issues in part because the, I think there are two core issues. One is what is the, mach the machine? What is the machine trying to accomplish and goal? Right? AI and ML are fantastic at finding new ways to accomplish a mission that wouldn't have occurred to you, or I, or a person. Right? Go was it twenty six? What's the move in Go? Um, the famous AI. The game. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. AI that made. I think yeah. it's move yeah. twenty six. Right. On the other the, hand, the machine beat the human at Go. Yeah. Um, on the other hand. We don't know what we want to accomplish out of a out of AML, right? When you said the flower shop, the first thought that came to my mind was the slide behind me, which is I know exactly who's selling flowers and generating an inordinate amount of money. It's the one selling the cannabis flower, <laughs> and like, you know, that we don't have a system. They could detect and find a lot of things that maybe you know maybe they could find a lot of Denny Hastert's. But it could potentially target those scarce human resources to check uh, that question. Yeah, well, perhaps, or a different way, it could generate a tremendous number of false positives, Actually, right? Think, and so, so it would improve on the, the false positive front. And But I, I take your point well, on the prioritization. So if you, if you start to have um, uh, an ability to find more financial crime faster and to understand in more detail what types of financial crime you're finding, now you'd have an ability to take a, a direction and pointing from governments that say, you know what, we only care or this year, we're going to focus on these types of financial crime, give us anything that, that fits that, so, but, that but, billing. But, but let, me, let me flip it a little bit in terms of proxying and discrimination and inclusion issues, right? You know, if you take as a given people from a certain background or national origin or last name, et cetera, are higher risk. Right, but you at a financial institution would never purposefully discriminate or have a process by which you say, well, we don't really want that kind of person because that's clearly unethical, getting back to your data ethics point. Now the AI ML says, no, 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 it's not that kind of person. It's a person who subscribes to this you know, totally weird thing or eats at this restaurant, right? So like, suppose you're really concerned about S Somali people in Minneapolis and, you know, you, you, you're trying to figure it out and it comes to shop at this kind of grocery store and the AI flags this as being correlated with being Somali and maybe the person sitting behind the desk on the other side of the world recognize that or maybe they don't and the institution starts to say, well, look, our customer base that's causing us a lot of cost has this thing from AIML, so let's shy away, let's not target our ads for services to people who've shopped at these stores. So that's, 
I think you're right, it does come really back to ensuring that we're thinking about the ethics in this, both in terms of bias on the front end, so I think you're speaking to bias, so what elements and data are being used to make a decision? Can you explain the decision was that was made, so do you have explainability around your models? And then the outcomes, regardless of whether you can do that, is, are the outcomes still in some way biased or discriminatory? which can, you could have back testing or independent uh, back testing to, to take a look at. In our discussion questions in the pre-conference yesterday, one of them was, would we support having central banks acting as a KYC, know your customer, yeah. utility, <laughs> uh, and a central repository of data that could be a trusted source? What, where do you two fall on that? Whether we could have central banks is the... KYC utility. Absolutely. There's no question why, that we, whether we could do it. Um, should uh, we? Should we? I think there's a lot of positives, actually. So um, uh, the danger for central banks is the one of the, the many is the um, question of having to manage some of those risks of taking on that service responsibility, working through the conflicts of offering a service while also being for central banks that also are supervisors and regulators, but those can be dealt with. Um, and uh, thinking about, I, I go back to one of our speakers earlier today saying, how many tasks do you want central banks to take on? Should they be more narrow and focused? Should they take on several tasks? I think those are some of the, the policy risks and challenges to think through, but could a central bank do it? Uh, would it be helpful to have a, a centralized utility in this sense, a, a government-backed central bank take on that responsibility? I think it could show some promise. So I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with all of those points. I think there's a lot to be gained from it, particularly as it, as it would lower costs for, for industry as a trusted central repository. I do get a little concerned about the tension that Jennifer mentioned about uh, size of mandate, but I also get concerned with another tension, which is independence. The central bank of the future, to me, needs to be an independent entity uh, in this conduct of monetary policy. And if you're independent in one sense, then you tend to be independent in others. And if I'm a registry of all of my customers, and I won't use the US, although I think one could easily see the applicability, but suppose I'm in England and suppose this is a dystopian future like that show Years by Years, right? And uh, you know they're trying to find all the people who illegally stayed after Brexit. Hmm. And they wanna go to the Know Your Customer repository and most of the people who illegally stayed are probably engaged in international money transmission because they stayed, because that's where their job was and their family. And so do you, you know, what happens when the immigration department calls up the central bank and says, give me your list. How independent is the central bank? How independent do we want them to be from an AML national security government perspective? And, you know, communities are smart. If they know that getting a bank account leads to potential uh, threats, they'll leave the financial system. And that's a tension. Yeah. I would uh, offer, and I'm going to open this up to questions in a sec here, that um, I think there's a lot of interest in, instead of using a, a central data utility for KYC to adopt what people are calling the traveling algorithm, leave the data decentralized and, and create an algorithm that can go analyze it within an encryption format, keep it anonymized so that the, the machine doesn't need to see the, the words that we need to see to look at information. So you could potentially encrypt it in a way that it doesn't create a central honeypot, but there is an ability to go look for patterns. Financial crimes have typologies that machines often, if they have enough data, can recognize human trafficking looks different from drugs and so on. So I want to ask you about um, blockchains, but I want to open it to the uh, to the group first, and if we don't get questions, I will ask you about blockchains. Uh, Chris? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Chris Glover from the Gates Foundation. So before I entered philanthropy, 
I was on the front lines writing enforcement actions against institutions that had failed to comply with US laws and regulations on anti-money laundering. And often, it wasn't necessarily that they had actually laundered money. It was that they had fallen afoul of the standards that were expected. Uh, and those standards are quite high and demanding. If we know that things are not working that well, what in your minds are the biggest blocks to reforming them? Is it that there's a small group of people who think that actually the system works well and we just need to push it harder? Or is it their fear of doing something different? Or are we afraid to think about new ways of using, using technology and so on? But what do you think are the biggest blocks and, and that we should be focusing on? I think at the moment, a lot of the energy is focused around optimizing the current way of staying regulatorily compliant, um, which is not focused on an outcome of identifying financial crime, but is focused on an outcome of doing what my regulator expects cheaply. Um, so I, I think we need to really change uh, uh, collectively um, our mindsets around focusing on outcomes and using the technology and, and, and opportunities it provides to, to improve our, our outcomes altogether. Um, on, the, on the kind of, across the, I guess across the whole system, there's the fear of the change, fear of the unknown. What do you mean data has to be put in a cloud to give you the, the um, uh, processing power to enable uh, this kind of compute? Uh, we're not sure how we feel about clouds yet. What do you mean you need cross-border information sharing? We're not sure how we feel about that. What is this AI of which you speak? Um, I'm not sure I understand how it works. And um, I've heard really scary terms like black box and unsupervised learning. Um, and that doesn't sound like anything that a regulator should be uh, behind. So there's a bit of a fear of the unknown. I think there's a, a need to, to continue to to um, educate and to focus on what is the outcome we're truly trying to achieve. So, so I had this weird uh, epiphany experience. I was discussing this issue with somebody from law enforcement. I was going on and on about the rise in SARS. And he said, well, you know, I don't see what your problem is. I said, well, each of these is costly. And there comes a point where the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. Right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, that's all an economist says repeatedly when posed with any question. <clears throat> and the law person said, there, what do you mean marginal cost? There's no cost to, to this. And I said, well, you, you know, and all of it, I said, yeah, where do you think it came from? He said, well, it doesn't cost, you know, it's in the database. It's sitting there. I can use it whenever I want. It's of no cost to me. The more things in the database, the better. And that, to me, was the fundamental mindset problem which was from his perspective, there was no marginal cost yeah. to additional SARS. And from my perspective, there's somebody out there who wasn't included in the financial system because the cost of onboarding him was greater than the expected economic return that that person's account would generate. And I, but to add to that, I think you're exactly right. In, in speaking with um, uh, regulators, AML regulators, former colleagues, now as a banker, right? I'm on the other side. Uh, there, there's a, just a lack of trust when banks say the amount of money we're, we're spending to produce this SAR isn't getting the outcomes. Yes, we'd like to spend less money, but like, let's not even start there. Let's just talk about putting money towards something that would ha produce the better outcome, the more effective outcome. There's so much suspicion as to the motivation of the financial industry that there's a fundamental um, failure in trust between two major players in a system that are meant to be working towards the same goal. So there's certainly um, a challenge there to overcome. One of the things I covered in my Harvard papers is this is the single most expensive compliance area and the most dangerous for the industry. So it's a huge deterrent. The, the industry is not willing to take risk in this space and they're not willing to cut money, even if it might be more effective for fear that they'll be criticized. Having said that, I'm, I think it is going to change. I think there's a sea change sweeping over us with people realizing that there's better tech. We had a question. We had questions over here. Did, OK. So Aaron, your point about what kind of crime are we trying to uh, solve for. Um, 
I actually want to hear you to answer that question. Um, I recognize this isn't necessarily a central bank question, um, but I want to posit the idea that if what we want out of this is not just to um, reduce the amount or, or solve the amount of financial crimes, but we want to figure out how to do it in a cross-border fashion because it's going to be more efficient, et cetera, it seems to me that stopping terrorism uh, is kind of a good one to think about, and it's part of the, it's, I would say, the big reason why, why, at least in the U.S., we've ended up where we've ended up, right? Um, but terrorism is not, is clearly not a U.S. only problem. And so I'd like to hear your perspective on that, but also, if you, Jennifer, just from your perspective, you've also been saying that different kinds of crimes, financial crimes, have different kinds of patterns. And I'm wondering whether you think that the way that SARS work today and the $10,000 limit and all the rest of it, if that's actually effective, if we said we want to we want to focus on reducing terrorism, like what would we need to do if that were indeed the target? What does that look like in terms of a, from a transactions perspective and a behind the scenes perspective? For ter terrorism fundamentally looks different. It's changing too. Uh, so um, uh, we had a, a, a time period where you had financing, a, a, a big financers of terrorism uh, that came external to the group. Then you had uh, groups that took over territory and earned their own money from the populace um, and uh, took money from uh, by. Uh, breaking banks, et cetera, breaking in and actually taking cash out of banks, uh, which is a fundamentally different funding model. And then you have the problem of, of terrorist fighters, people who travel all around the world to engage um, in, in uh, terrorism. And so each of those has a different kind of financial footprint to them. Um, generally speaking, if I was going to talk about what's the best, how should we change the CTR to help with, with terrorist finance, I would say go to a zero. Uh, threshold and um, fo and give international transfers at a zero threshold, uh, provide that data. Um, it's something that already happens in Australia. Canada has a does the same thing, but has it at a thousand dollar threshold. Um, but I, I, I want to take it back to your initial question: is is that in fact the top crime we should be focused on? It's it's scary. Um, it takes lives. It has political impacts, but it's pretty low incidence. What about fraud? Fraud hits almost every. What about elder abuse and, and people who lose their money through fraud? That's high uh, volumes of folks who, who experience that. Should we focus there instead? Uh, what about corruption and grand corruption in, in, where you have uh, nation states that fail because high-level political officials loot the country dry and, and move that money abroad. Should we focus our, our efforts there? Um, I think there's a number of good places, but I agree, you can't be everything to everyone. So if we really want to make an impact for good, I do think it would be helpful to have governments prioritize. I think central banks can play a role in stimulating that conversation because you need to bring together policymakers, um, enforcement and security services, regulators, um, into a, a conversation to, to be willing to set forth uh, a, a combined view of what the priorities are, which is you know, never an easy thing. <laughs> so um, corruption is valid, but I debate, I think the next person to enter my slide uh, show is Paul Manafort. Uh, who had, I think, nine uh, shell companies in Delaware without beneficial ownership, and also among the other crimes that, the, again, one of the reasons this is such a powerful tool for law enforcement is whatever you think about what Manafort did, the easiest crimes to commit, convict him of were the ones where it was just very, very clear illegal use of, of money. So what we have is a money laundering has become a tool for almost all generic forms of law enforcement for a wide set of potential crimes because it is far more cut and blank than things about intent and, and, and other areas. 
Um, elder abuse is a big deal. I think I had a SAR filed on me for elder abuse this year, which was a, an illustrative point and a totally separate story, but I, I'm glad they filed, frankly. Uh, I was kind of waiting for somebody to call me and investigate the situation. The fact that they tipped you off. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. I, it, no, they're it, not supposed to tell you that. <laughs> I, I, I can't be positive, but I bet if you query the database, I'll show up in it. And, and, and that's actually... It, the, one of the problems is that fit my category of crimes that had been occurring but nobody had been reporting. I don't think, I think the rate of elder abuse was constant through that time horizon. Yes, demographically we've had an increase in the number of elders, but the, there's been a, a hockey stick of filings on it. Uh, that being said, um, uh, Jen, I, I, it's unfair to ask me to answer my own question, uh, but I, I, I will, which is that uh, number one is terrorism, uh, but I think Jennifer's point is right. Terrorism isn't necessarily 9-11. Uh, I think the San Bernardino shooter could have been found in a traveling, if the traveling algorithm were running around, here, you know, each of it, here's a person maxing out all these weird sources of credit and then wiring all this money one way to Saudi Arabia and then, you know, oh, whoa, well, going to a gun store and all these different, the financial thing that came out of that from the limited amount I saw in real time, because the other question is, do you want to use AML to prevent the crime, which is a hidden... In terrorism, I think we're trying to prevent, in kind of minority report style, very different than the other ones we're trying to somewhat catch. And right? the system is currently set up in the AML and terrorism space. It is an after-the-fact reporting system. Yeah. It is not live. Fraud, fraud payment screening, like when you get the text, is that really you buying the sweatshirt at the store? Um, that's... That's live uh, screening. Uh, sanction screening is live, but AML is, is not. So, so I would also posit that the incidence of San Bernardino type terrorists may be higher in the future than the other. I could be wrong. Uh, number two would be sex trafficking. I just, that's a Mazel's hierarchy, personal choice, uh, you know, in terms of, of you know, uh, crime. Uh, number three would be high net worth tax evasion. I say that as a public finance economist who, you know, you want to raise revenue as efficiently as possible and then spend revenue for, for valuable purposes. There's a lot of high net worth tax evasion. The AML system, I think the audit rate is, is now equal for the bottom 10% of income as it is for the top one, right? With the marginal benefit to society to catch a billionaire cheating taxes versus, uh, you know, somebody earning minimum wage. Uh, I think you generate a tremendous amount of revenue that could be used for other social good and purposes. Um, that, 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 that would be my three, but that's a policy choice, and I'm not sure the central bank is the entity that we should have in our political system to rake those three over a plethora of other positions, uh, organized crime, for example. I'm going to say, I think we were going to take one more. Is that okay? Go ahead. I don't know the history of this field, so I'm just curious how we came here. I was grappling with the first principles question. In the field of privacy, we have a very important concept that liberal democracies do not run mass surveillance systems. Uh, the United States government uh, would not be able to screen every email or every text message or run searches inside it or store copies of it. You would need a, a law enforcement agents would need a warrant to go into Paul Manafort's email, and that would be based on some other information that you'd have to show a judge. And you've got that whole machinery of privacy. Why do we not see any of that around finance? Why are we running a mass surveillance system on finance? Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. Um, and it's definitely um, policymakers' choice on where they wanted to set the balance on the spectrum between data privacy at one end of a spectrum and security uh, at the other. Um, and we've seen that where uh, different countries and communities come out on that issue change over time and it come across different ends of that spectrum. Um, and certainly in response to, to uh, different prompts. When something really bad happens on the security front, we move towards greater security and more surveillance uh, requirements on financial institutions. When we have significant data privacy concerns, a post Snowden, something that, like to that effect, then it moves in the other direction. Um, but those are policy choices made by governments that financial institutions then 
and are required to uh, implement. So, so one reason I support raising the currency transaction threshold to its indexed amount, which is somewhere between fifty to sixty thousand dollars, depending on what you want to uh, index it for, uh, is exactly that, which is this question about what level of information should be allowed to be found, what level, right? Because ultimately, this is an incredibly powerful tool for conviction purposes. I mean, people can do structuring of financial situations and somewhat un unknowingly, one of, the, one of the examples of somebody who didn't make the Hall of Fame is Bob Dole. Bob Dole got caught for structuring at Riggs Bank. Th those of you who, who know Washington, this was like the preeminent, it's Abraham Lincoln's bank. And Bob Dole, for whatever reason, Senator Dole from, like cash, and uh, uh, Riggs Bank ultimately went down over an AML violation, essentially they got bought by by a competitor, but I think it was Saudi Arabia or something, some Middle East country, they were doing some really bad shady stuff. Like there's some really bad stuff. But in this deep dive that came out, it turned out that Bob Dole liked to have cash and every Friday he withdrew like 8,000 bucks or every other Friday. And if you go to the bank and withdraw $8,000 consistently over 10 years, you were supposed to be filed on. But the bank looked at the you know, Senate majority or minority leader and said, we are not going to file a SAR on this powerful senator who, you know, I think we can all realize just happened to pay for things in cash, right? And so this kind of history of it and the judgment of it is, gets to be very tricky. And I don't think there's enough of your voice and that position being heard in the general debate and instead, there's a tremendous amount of the, the SAR database is free for me. Put as much as you can there because I, you know, could use it to stop the next 9-11 or stop, catch some really bad guy or girl. So law enforcement tells us that the average price to buy a human being in the United States is $7,000. That's under the CTR. So this has been a fantastic discussion. I think we're going to have to figure out how to use this data. It's going to get used. And our mission is how are we going to regulate that, make it safe, have due process around the use of it. But um, I, I think these are just the urgent questions of our time. And I cannot thank you both enough for all your comments. So please join me in thanking the panel.